Well, hello there. This is Cliff Searcy, and we're coming to you again with another edition of Music and the Word with the Searcy's, and we're going to be dealing with lesson number 15 in our study of the life of Jesus today. It's called Jesus Rejected in His Hometown, and what a story that's going to be. Hey, we're moving into the Christmas season, so we thought that we, the Searcy's, would include some of the Christmas music that we had recorded, and so here's a great Christmas song that says, Glory to God in the Highest. Fear not, the angel said, Behold the Messiah's come, The one of whom you read, And as they spoke to men that day, The heavenly host around the throne joined in to say, Glory to God in the highest, Peace on earth, goodwill to men, Heavenly angels announced, Here's another great Christmas song. Come on, ring those bells. Everybody likes to take a holiday. Everybody likes to take a rest. Spending time together with the family. Sharing lots of love and happiness. Come on, ring those bells. your birthday. Celebrations come because of something good. Celebrations we like to recall. Mary had a baby boy in Bethlehem, the greatest celebration of them all. Jesus is the King, born for you and me, come on, 
Here's another old favorite, Go Tell It on the Mountain. I hope that you enjoyed our music today. We're going to get right into our lesson. We're continuing with our study of the life of Jesus. This is episode number 15, and it's called Jesus Being Rejected in His Hometown. He came back to Nazareth, began to minister and to teach in the synagogue, and wait till you see what happened. It caused him to make the statement that we've heard so often, that is so often quoted, that a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and among his own people, all right? We'll pick this up in Luke chapter 4, and it tells us that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Now, this is after the great revival that happened in Samaria. We studied that in the last lesson that we talked about the life of Jesus. We talked about the prejudice that the disciples had in going through Samaria and dealing with the Samaritan people. We talked about Jesus meeting with the woman at the well in Samaria. Remember that? And we talked about how, as a result of her going and telling all of her kinsfolk and all the people of that town about Jesus and about the Messiah having come, how there was a great revival in Samaria. Let me tell you something. When you get done with a big victory in your life, you be on your guard because that's when the devil likes to come along and throw everything but the kitchen sink at you. And sometimes he throws the kitchen sink at you too, okay? He throws everything he's got at you right after you've had a great victory. And this was a great, great victory. And the disciples had really a learning situation. You see, they had no dealing with Samaritans. It was because of their racial prejudice, because of their nationality prejudice. And they wanted nothing to do with them because remember, the Samaritans were of mixed heritage. They weren't pure Jews. They were intermingled in marriage in generations before and even present generations intermarried with people of Arab descent. And uh, the disciples prided themselves on the fact that they were pure Jews. They could look back in their pedigree and look back in their line, and they could see that all the way back through, Jew had married Jew, and that they were pure Jews, but they did not have any intermingling of other nationalities that were a part of their ancestry. 
but they looked down on Samaritans because they had intermingled in marriage in previous generations with the people that came from Arab descent. Well, understand that in 606 BC, that the many of the Israelites were carried off into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar and by his forces. And there in Babylon, they were there for 70 years, 70 whole years. And of course, Jeremiah the prophet had told them, don't think you're going to be going back soon. You're going to be here for 70 years. So build houses while you're here, plant gardens, get yourself kind of settled to the point where you're going to move someday, but most of you or many of you won't be alive by that time. Maybe there'll be some that'll still be alive that came out of Jerusalem that'll go back, some of the younger ones, but some of you are going to live your whole lives here in Babylon. So don't uh, just sit around and do nothing and refuse to build or refuse to make yourself some kind of a future. You're going to be here for 70 long years. So plant gardens, build houses, get yourself some land that you can live on and, and, and take care of yourself and really go ahead and plan on the fact you're going to be here. Other prophets came along and said, no, 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 Jeremiah is wrong. All the other prophets said there's going to be prosperity and you guys are going to be going back soon. And everybody who seemed to want to believe the prophets that brought the message that they wanted instead of the one true prophet, Jeremiah, that was bringing the message that truly came from God. God wanted them warned. And he told them, it's in the 29th chapter of Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you. They're plans to give you a hope and a future. Your generations are going to have a future. Your descendants are going to have a future. I have plans for you. But God was trying to make them understand that the plan for now was that they be in Babylon for 70 years. And so, of course, being there, some of them just didn't marry the Jewish people that had been exiled with them, but some of them married some of the other folks. And as a result, they had mixed heritage. Well, they got back to the area of Samaria. Now, you understand that, as we told you in previous lessons, the capital was moved from Samaria to Jerusalem, and that's where the Jews would go to worship every single year, okay, for the Passover and for all the feasts. But originally, there was a time when worship originally happened in Samaria because that's where Mount Sinai was. And there was a contention between the Samaritans and the Jews as where the proper place for worship should be because they said, you should be worshiping here where the law was given in Mount Sinai. And there was this terrible conflict between them because they said, look, you folks are saying you're children of Abraham. We are too. Because, you know, we're also descended from Abraham because Ishmael is one of his sons. So the Arab part of us in our heritage does come from Abraham because Ishmael was Abraham's son as well. But part of us also comes from Israel, who actually was Jacob. His name was changed to Israel. We're children of Israel too. But the Jews, the pure Jews that were there in Judea, they wanted nothing to do at all with the Samaritans. Well, realize that the capital and the throne room in the kingdom used to be actually in Samaria. That's where King Ahab had the kingdom at that point in time. But uh, they wanted nothing to do with the Samaritans. And so Jesus was showing these disciples in a very, very pointed way that they were to accept people other than themselves. They were to get out of their comfort zone. It was not going to be us four and no more. There was going to be an outreach. And of course, he was later to tell them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to every creature. What did he tell them as he ascended later on? He said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And still they didn't get it. Even as the early church began, they were blind to the fact that they were supposed to bring the message of the gospel to the nations, to all people, not just to the Jews. And perhaps we'll deal with that in the days ahead if we go ahead and we may be doing a study of the book of Acts sometime in the future. And we'll see in the early church how God caused them to finally understand that. But Jesus now is setting the seeds to make them understand that they are going to be commissioned to go and bring the gospel to everybody, to every race, to every nationality to the people that they right now don't even want to associate with. They don't want to sit down and have a meal with them. They don't even want to talk with them. These people, God's going to send them to evangelize them and cause them to be born to the kingdom so they're going to be their brothers and sisters in Christ. And they absolutely had no concept of, it, of that at that point. No concept at all. But Jesus is now starting to deal with that 
prejudice on their parts. We're going to see as we go further through the story, many, many other times they begin to deal with that and start to soften them up and make them to understand that he didn't see things the way that they saw it. And God didn't see things the way that they saw it. And so he comes out of that great revival in Samaria and the disciples are puzzled and they're scratching their heads because they're trying to understand what just happened. We just saw the Samaritans accept Jesus as the Messiah and they can't do that because they're not Jews. They were confused. And so Jesus, the Bible says, after this great revival in Samaria, he goes back to Galilee where he was from, there in the north, around the Sea of Galilee, okay? A two or three day journey. And he goes back and Luke chapter four says that he taught in their synagogues, going from city to city, that would have been, and everyone praised him. And then he went to Nazareth. That was his hometown. Hometown boy does good. It must have been with headline in the newspaper that day, okay? He went there where he had been brought up, it says. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. You see, what would happen is they would go to the synagogue and somebody would be able to volunteer to be the one that would read from the scriptures. You see, they all didn't have Bibles in their homes. And uh, fortunate cities had scrolls where they had the scriptures there at the synagogue. And you'd have to go to the synagogue in order to be able to find the scriptures because you didn't have them in your home. How many Bibles do we have in our each one of our homes these days? The Word of God is still the best-selling book in the world, and it's really easy to get a Bible. But back then, they didn't have that. They went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and they read it. And Jesus stood up indicating that he was willing to read. And they were also proud of him. They heard the words and the praises that had come. You know, it's really nice when you are in a hometown and you come back home and everybody has heard the reports about a wonderful thing you've done in other places. They're saying, wow, he's really putting Nazareth on the map for us. He's really making us look good. Everybody's talking about Jesus of Nazareth, talking about what a great, great thing he has done and how these wonderful miracles are happening and they're praising our town they're making people understand that this is jesus that came from nazareth he's making our city look good he's really we better give him the key to the city he is really one of the most honorable people that we have here in our city we're so proud of our hometown boy and he's going in synagogue after synagogue and city after city and now on this particular sabbath he goes to nazareth okay and he gets up, and he stands up to read, and they hand him a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. But it says in verse 17, he unrolled it, and he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. And this comes from Isaiah chapter 61. And he read this prophecy that Isaiah had made about the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. Everybody's eyes in that whole synagogue were fastened on him. They were wondering what he was going to say. Maybe he was going to give them a report of what had happened and some of the missions he had been involved in. Maybe he was going to give a report of these stories that they had heard and they would get an actual eyewitness account and an actual revealing from Jesus of exactly what happened in these various towns where he had ministered. What is he going to say next? And so in verse 20, it says that all the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. What is he going to say next? And he began by saying to them, today... This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What I read that Isaiah prophesied has now come to pass, and you have heard it being said, this scripture is now fulfilled. Well, they really didn't kind of catch on to what he was saying. They didn't realize at that point that he was saying it's fulfilled because, hey folks, it's talking about me. The prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years ago, when he prophesied about the Messiah, he was talking about about me because I am the Messiah. They hadn't figured out yet at that point that that's what he was saying. So it says in verse 22, all spoke well of him. We're amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? Did you hear how nice he read? What perfect diction. What beautiful dialect. When he read this, did you hear the emotion that he put into this? Did you hear how beautifully he read the scriptures? They were just such feeling, such emotion, such, such a tremendous way. He made those scriptures alive to us the way he read them. Oh, this was just great. 
And then he said to them, Surely you'll quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. All you are saying, okay, we're ready for the show. We've heard all these stories about what you've done other places. Do it here. We want to see what you can do here now in your hometown. So let's see now. You've worked some miracles among us. We're all set. We all came. And now that you're here, we're all excited about seeing what you're going to do. But it says in verse 24, I tell you the truth, he said, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. You're not going to accept me. When you hear what I have to say and you understand who I claim to be, you're not going to accept me. Yeah, they accept me in Capernaum. They accept me in all these other towns. And as a result, I can do works there. I can do miracles. But like you just said, isn't this Joseph's son? As far as you people are concerned, I'll always just be Mary's boy. I'll always just be Joseph's son. I'll always be the person that you saw grow up here, just like you had said. You will not believe in me. I can tell you won't believe in me when I tell you who I really am. I just told you that I'm the Messiah, and you haven't even figured it out. It went right over your head because you can't comprehend the possibility that such a thing can be true. He said, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Then he said in verse 25, I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of those, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. There was one lady, a widow lady, that was willing to believe what God was telling her and was willing to obey what God was asking her to do. And though there were many, many needy widows and needy people in that time, she got the blessing because she was willing to hear what God was saying. And he said, I'll tell you, there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Why? Because he obeyed what God told him to do. And when he was told by the prophet to go and dip in the, in the Jordan River seven times, he did exactly what he was told to do. He was teachable. And so, just like the other widows were passed by in Zarephath, just like the other lepers were passed by in Syria, you folks are in danger of being passed by because you will not accept who I am. The widow lady, she understood who Elijah was and she accepted him. Naaman the leper understood who Elisha the prophet was and accepted him and believed in what he had said. And so as a result, he received something. And I just sat here and told you that this prophecy of Isaiah from the 61st chapter has just now been fulfilled in your hearing. And I've told you, basically, I'm the Messiah. I've come to do all these things. And they said, wasn't that a nice speech? Didn't he really read well? Oh my, we're so proud of him. You aren't capable of understanding what I'm saying because I'm from this hometown. You don't believe that I can be who I am. You don't believe in me. And so just like the widows of Elijah's time, missed out. And just like the lepers of Elisha's time missed out, you're going to miss out too because you don't accept and believe that I am who I claim to be. Wow, it says all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, they drove him out of the town. They took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. They were praising him a moment ago, but now they take him to the edge of the cliff and they're about to throw him over the cliff and kill him. They want to kill him because of he spoke the truth and they didn't want to hear it. Remember when later on Stephen spoke the truth and they gnashed with their teeth and they went and killed him too. People sometimes talk really nice about you, but they don't want to know the truth. But somehow he escaped that. Verse 30 says he walked right through the crowd, went on his way and he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee on the Sabbath, began to teach the people. And it tells us in John chapter 4 that when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They'd seen all he had done in the Jerusalem at the Passover feast, for he'd also been there. When he went to another area in Galilee, Capernaum, they gladly welcomed him there. Now fasten your seatbelt. 
Nazareth had been his hometown, but he was gone. He said goodbye. He shook the dust off his feet. He left Nazareth as his hometown. He went to Capernaum. And from that point on, the city he lived in was Capernaum. It was not any longer Nazareth. He said, goodbye. You don't want to believe in me? That's fine. I'll go where they do believe in me, where I can work miracles, where they will believe I am who I claim to be. Our pastor, Dr. Mike Brown, he has said this over and over again, and he's made this so clear. Don't hang around and insist on staying where you're just being tolerated. If you're just being tolerated and people are just treating you really bad, you don't have to stay there. Leave where you're just being tolerated and go where you'll be celebrated. Some people feel a loyalty that they have to stay someplace and God hasn't told them to stay there. They just feel like, well, I just have to stay here just because it's just the thing I've always done and the thing I'm comfortable with. Do what Jesus did. Get up from people that treat you badly and go find people that will celebrate you. You'll find people that will be thrilled to death that you come to where they are. You see? And that's what Jesus did. My. Are we in danger of doing the same thing that these people of uh, Nazareth did? Do we fail to see that God's using somebody in our midst? Maybe we've known them all their lives and now God's using them in a mighty way and we may be really dead to that. We may not understand that. We may actually really fail to realize how God's using them and we're actually passing them by. It's not necessary that everybody uh, just rejects somebody just because they're from their hometown, because they're familiar with them. We saw that in Bible college. Some of the people that we knew that it looked like would never make it. All of a sudden, years later, we saw that God used them in a mighty, mighty ministry. And we had to change our thinking and realize this is somebody God's using, so we'll embrace them. We'll accept them. We will celebrate them because God's chosen them. Let's pray together. Let's make this a different kind of a prayer. Lord, teach us from what we've learned here. Teach us. Jesus was not accepted because the people chose not to accept him. And as a result, they lost out. Don't let us miss out. If there's somebody that you're using, dear God, in our midst that you've raised up for ministry, don't let us be so ignorant and so foolish in our thinking and so stubborn in our thinking that we won't accept somebody that you've accepted. Let us be quick to realize that you've raised up a ministry that you're using somebody. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's a friend that's found the Lord and all of a sudden God's using them in a great way. Make us quick to realize what you're doing in that person's life and to accept their ministry, we pray, dear God, and so we can be blessed by that ministry. Don't pass us by. Don't cause us to be passed by because we won't receive that which you've sent in order to minister to us, we pray. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, that's been a different kind of a lesson today, hasn't it? I hope you enjoyed it. That's what happened when Jesus was rejected in his own hometown, okay? We'll pick it up again next week with another adventure in the life of Jesus as we continue our study of the life of Jesus here on Music and the Word with the Circes. 